Um, welcome to what will in fact be the last panel for uh, Virtual Heroin 2020. Um, we are going to be discussing, um, well, let's, let, let's, let's start. In, in summary, the Little Wars piece on is historical wargaming dying seems to have uh, created quite a, quite a f storm of discussion, I think would be a fair description, wouldn't it, on, on Twitter. So I figured let's, let's haul together a bunch of folks and, and have a chat about it and, and see, what, see what we think. So I've tried, tried quite hard to pick uh, not just middle-aged white guys, <laughs> particularly not just middle-aged white British guys, since it's very clear there's a, there's a different perception of this on both sides of the Atlantic and there's also a, a lot of things that cropped up as part of that discussion on Twitter such things as as gatekeeping the hobby do we should we obviously um etc 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 so um my guests who if you'd like to say hi and give your give yourself sort of the 15 second introduction uh will work um anti-clockwise around clockwise around my screen starting with Jay Arnold the veteran wargamer Hi, I'm Jay Arnold. I'm host of the Veteran Wargamer podcast. I am a veteran two times over in that I've been wargaming for 30-ish, 35 years, somewhere in there. Um, I'm also a veteran of service in the United States Army, uh, active duty, reserve, and National Guard. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Uh, down below me as I look at the screen, uh, Elon Mitchell-Smith. <laughs> Introduce yourself, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm Elon. Um, uh, I've been wargaming, I guess, for, for most of my adult life. Um, and I have at times organized some games at conventions here in California and in the US. And I um, have gamed in Texas and California and a little bit on the East Coast. Um, and I work adjacent to history. I'm a professor of medieval literature and medieval Renaissance studies um, at California State University in Long Beach, which is uh, a great school. And i just like to take a minute to thank Jay for his service. Thanks so much. Um, I know that's sometimes awkward, but I sure appreciate your service. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, moving around. Uh, Annie Norman. Hello, I'm Annie. I run Bad Squiddo Games. We specialize in female miniatures, uh, believable female miniatures, which generally have clothes on and stuff. It's very odd. It's very odd, but it, it works, apparently. Um, and we also do guinea pigs and scenics. Loads of scenics. I need to keep mentioning the scenics because I seem to have loads and loads of them now. Um, but yeah, we're, we're cool. And we do all sorts of stuff from, obviously, throughout history to fantasy to sci-fi. And you should have a look because they're all really good. <laughs> I was about to say, you do be <laughs> Bucket loads of historicals. Oh yes. <laughs> and I, for those who've been not paying attention recently, I'm Mike Whitaker. I'm chairman of Peterborough War Games Club in the UK. I help put on the real Herald War Games show when it actually runs. Um, and a former co-presenter of Meeples and Miniatures and of my own podcast when I eventually get around to it again. So um, we will also at some point, I hope, be joined by Henry Hyde, who I will get to introduce himself when he turns up. Um, but for now, it'll be just the four of us, and hopefully we can slip Henry in fairly seamlessly in. Uh, knowing Henry's ability to talk for England, it may about even out the ratio <laughs> of how much everybody gets to talk. So. Yeah, quick, we can all talk. <laughs> quick <laughs> talk while Henry's not here. <laughs> well, sorry, Henry, just kidding. <laughs> oh, um, where do we start? Um, Jay, Elon, um, how, does, how, does it, how does it feel in the States? I, I picked up the vibe from the... Um, Little Wars guys, that, that they have a sense that it, perhaps it is starting to die as an aspect of the hobby. Uh, are they wrong? I, I, if, I can, if I can start off, I, I think that the, the impression that they're getting or the impression that some of the other Americans put forth on that video, because I, I would like to note that, um, humble brag, I, am, I, was, I was saved for last on that video. <laughs> but uh, I think their impression is is somewhat uh, colored by the fact that they are on the East Coast and attend the HMGS Historical Miniatures Gaming Society East uh, conventions, which and I've been to. I've been to Fall In once, and I, I have to say it was pretty. It was pretty old. It was pretty white, and I, I think that there's a number of factors that go into that. Um, looking at many of the responses that the video got on Twitter, uh, I, I wonder how much of that is people 
looking at the types of games that are being played and saying, well, that's not historical war game. And I wonder how much of that impression is based on people not seeing what they're used to and saying, well, to themselves, well, if it's not what I'm used to, then it's not real in quotes war game. Uh, I wonder if that's part of it. Um, Lon Weiss, who runs Brigade Games, uh, he had a, uh, he's been on, on my podcast before. He had a comment where, you know, he, he produces, he himself produces a number of historical ranges. He's in the United States. Um, and we have a number of smaller independent rules writers in the U- United States also. Uh, case in point, Jay Wiley with Wiley Games, his fistful of lead. I mean, whether or not you can count a, a uh, Old West shoot 'em up as a historical game. I'm, there are some folks who would say yes. I'm sure there's some who say no. But he's also got a, a horse and musket, uh, French and Indian War uh, supplement. He's got a, Sp- a Mexican American War supplement. So, I mean, that, it's out there. I mean, there are people playing historical games, there are people buying historical miniatures. So, it's long positive about it. Yeah, well, that's absolutely positive. Yeah. Otherwise, he's, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's good. That's very good. <laughs> and he's he's doing Kickstarters for historical miniatures. And so, I, I again, I, I got to wonder if the anecdotal evidence is, is you know, not reliable. I, I know, shock of shocks, right? Elon, <laughs> It what's it like on the West Coast? Well, the West Coast is weird for wargaming in in the states. Um, you could have finished that sentence after the first three or four words, couldn't you? <laughs> I guess so. I, I mean, uh, this is my favorite part of of America, uh, of North America. Um, uh, but the but the wargaming is not always what I want it to be on the East Coast. I think it, it might resemble England in. Um, more in the sense that the clubs are a little bit more solid and there's a little bit more of a scene, or at least there used to be. And here it's a little bit hard to get things going. And we have a, uh, we're spread out. And so you have groups of between three and seven people playing kind of all over the state and it's hard to get momentum going. So, so California has that, like that's already um, the, um, I guess the lay of the land. In terms of historicals, I think that um, like chivalry, there's a sense that it's always in decline and that never changes, right? Um, so uh, the last of the dying breed, the people who still take it seriously, like that kind of rhetoric still informs a lot of conversations. But I think I'm with Jay in the sense that um, it's changing what is meant by historical uh, gaming. And here, uh, if we look at it in one way, there's absolutely no young people or women or people of color who are playing what we think of maybe as the old school war game, where there's a bunch of older white men who are really just have their flintlocks cocked to mansplain what you don't understand about the period. And it's just not fun. You know what I mean? Like I've never thought that was fun. That's one of the reasons I never painted Napoleonics. I just don't want to like, that's what the Napoleonic table always seemed like. And their miniatures kind of look terrible and the and the gun barrels are all spaghetti because they were cast in 1962 thrown in boxes since like that's just not fun but then like at our local con there's a chariot race game that is uses historical miniatures he uses a a a terrain set that's that's absolutely an arena it looks historical and that game is wildly popular mostly among people who are not war gamers right like that's the one time that people come into the miniatures area to play that game and they're shouting and chanting things and like to the point where you can't even play your game near them and they love it you know and so i think that uh, there's a change that's happening um or there's always changes happening um and so we're expanding our notion of history, but I, I think that's kind of a good thing because as someone who's read some history, I'm not always crazy about the way that history looks when a war gamer explains it to me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, Annie, you've probably, probably got the... the... Oh, Henry's here! Oh, Henry! We've got Henry. Yay! <laughs> Henry! He's connected. Hey, Henry! Get in there. Yay! Hi, guys. Hello. Hi! <laughs> 
we, we, we had started without you, but you haven't missed much. Jolly good. Jolly good. Um, we, we were just discussing the, the differences in um, both demographic graphics and, and general perception of, of historical gaming between East Coast, West Coast. And I was about to ask any, um, a sort of a context of something Elon has just said, what, do you get a feel for what your historical ranges get used for? Yes, yes, oh, I do. Um, <laughs> I do. I love this topic. <laughs> yes, um, I know. So the largest ranges of historicals that we do are the World War Two and the Dark Ages, and they are very largely used for bolt action and saga, which are two not very strictly historical games. They're almost that sort of history light sort of thing, but you can put as much or as little into it as you want. And that's definitely so I like looking at the, the crowd I've got it does tend to be it's quite spread out. But I do have a lot of younger people and that does seem to be it's almost like it's shifting. And I find very much when I see those. So I didn't see any of the Little War stuff. I've been kind of AWOL this week, sorting out all sorts of other stuff. So I haven't seen any of the interviews. So if I reference anything, I'm not talking about anybody who said anything because I haven't seen it. So <laughs> as a disclaimer, um, but I see a lot when I looked around um, certain awful forums um, in the past and that sort of topic comes up quite a bit. I, I definitely see it as that gatekeeping where it is that bunch of old men, <laughs> as you, you know, that's, that's who it is, um, sort of going around going, yes, oh, the youngins aren't into this. No, they're not into this. And it really reminded me of the bookkeeper in uh, ah, Never Ending Story at the very start. Where the where he comes in to get the the book. I assume you've all seen Never Ending Story. If you have a long time. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, he runs in to get the book. Uh, well, he runs into the bookshop, and this old man's sort of there going, "What are you doing here? Children don't like these. You're all like your beepity beeps." And the kid's like, "I've read all of these books." He's like, "Yeah." And it always reminds me of that. That whole sort of like, mm, "They're not into it." Like we are. <laughs> We're into different. So it's changing, and definitely, I think games are getting more and more accessible, which is making it grow. So they're not so much this enormous investment of time and money, which people have less of it now. Um, so because people aren't playing these mass battle, intensely historically accurate games, but they're still playing. They're playing different types of games, sort of skirmish games, and they are so much easier to get into. And as people are getting into the games as adults, it's a harder barrier. So when you're a child, you've got, and you start playing it, and then you continue or return to it as an adult, You've got that nostalgia where you just know you're going to love it and you go back into it. But if you're someone in their 20s and 30s and somebody says, hey, do you want to play some, some war games? And maybe you've played D&D &D or something like that. And you go, cool, what do I need? Um, if they say, right, you need to spend about £500 and you need to get all of these things and they all have to be painted this way. And then you might not like it. And then spend a month reading the rules. It's just not as, not as appealing. Um, Whereas if you go, say, something like Frostgrave or even Saga, you go, you need 10, 50 guys, whatever. Um, you can pretty much have one demo, get the gist of it. And then, again, you can get into it as, as much or as little as you like. So I find it really, because it is all anecdotal, but I feel like I'm, I'm definitely in the middle of that sort of older historical community and the, the hip youngins. <laughs> so I kind of see both sides, you know, which yeah. is, I guess, a fairly unusual sort of position to be in. It's so, I, yeah. <laughs> it's occurred to me while you were saying that, that is this whole sort of starting off with a little, not quite so historical skirmish game as, for want of a better word, a gateway drug. That yes. is <laughs> <laughs> both of us with the grey beards going, well, I remember my first box of airfix figures and playing with my kid brother. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. It's, and then people can get further into it. So I was always, I, I come from a fantasy wargaming background, and I was always like, oh, yes, or is that? I don't want to play that. Oh, they'll, yeah, they'll, they're not going to welcome me in there. And you sort of see it here as this caricature of dusty, you know, don't touch on Napoleonics. Sorry, Napoleonics, guys, you do kind of get the <laughs> Okay, a um, but yeah I saw it as that really inaccessible and I didn't want to just go and it not be good and then realized I've just been on another panel where I was talking about that whole if you find a good a good group of people it can make such a difference so I started playing with Saga because that was a yeah it was definitely a sort of smooth over and um, not too different but I had come from that sort of mass battle fantasy but um 
I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> Sorry, I, don't, I don't want to insert yeah, myself. Yeah, into that. yeah sorry. I, I don't want, because I want to hear from Henry too. Is that I don't want to take up too much. But I feel like that's a little bit the problem maybe, but that I, I absolutely have heard that attitude. I think you're 100% right that like, if you were to associate yourself as a historical war gamer and you play Saga, there's a sense that you have to apologize, right? That you have yeah. to like, Rug at least like my like saga yeah it's like that watered down but, and but it is because it's not like, the... but <laughs> no historian that i know has used the term dark ages in their career <laughs> you know what i mean like that term itself is not one that's used by historians and then if we're talking about like dark ages britain there is no way i'm gonna i'm gonna suggest there's no way that you can have a historical reproduction of the battle of malden at all. Because right. all we have is a sideways reference from Gildas to assume the rest of his audience knew what he was talking about. Well, yeah, and then you have narrative. Like, and, and like, the if you say that you're a literary war gamer, first of all, it means nothing. And second, you lose all the, the um, sense of authority <laughs> historical war game sometimes promises to give men. You know what I mean? But that's what Malden would have to be because the because the account that we have that everybody wants is the 10th century story about Malden. And that doesn't, I mean, that on just as, just as um, kind of ephemeral rules of conduct as Saga does. And so I think partly for me, like what I want to do is deconstruct the notion of history versus fun. <laughs> especially when the thing that we're calling history doesn't square up with what historians tend to call history. I may, I may have got you on the wrong panel. I should have stuck you on with uh, Harry Sidebottom and Rich Clark. I think it would have been brilliant fun. Henry, you, you're, you're itching, clearly. Give, give us the 15-second intro to who you are, in just case there is anybody who has no clue who you are, and, and feel free to dive in. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, Anyone who doesn't know who I am, uh, I've been a war gamer since 19, a proper war gamer since 1970-ish. Uh, I was playing with toy soldiers probably since about 1967. Uh, the first book I really imprinted on was the late Charles Grant, the war game published in 1971. Uh, ever since that day, I've had a real love and passion for the 18th century, the lace wars, that, that kind of era. But I play all kinds of things. Um, um, I, for a long time, uh, when I was a student, my my contact with the hobby was really through the magazines. I've always been a lover of books and magazines. Um, and there was a particular magazine called Practical War Game that sort of disappeared in the 90s. And a lot of us sat around saying, surely someone's going to pick up that magazine. It was so good. Nobody did. And so it was one of those, well, I suppose it'll have to be me then moments. And in, so in March 2006, I launched my own magazine called Battle Games, uh, which in 2011 got took uh, got taken over by a company called Atlantic Publishers but they kept me on as the editor designer uh, and then a couple of years later it merged with Miniature War Games magazine and became Miniature War Games with Battle Games and I was still kept on as the editor designer and then in 2015 or thereabouts it was taken over by Warner's a huge company who also produced lots of other things and I managed to stand that for about a year before I decided life was too short and went off to do something else. So I had about 10 years experience writing magazines, uh, editing magazines. In amongst all that, in 2013, my first book, The Wargaming Compendium, got published. And much to my astonishment, it became a bestseller in its niche uh, and is still selling. What can I say? I still get royalty checks from Pen and Sword. Uh, and I'm working on my next book called Wargaming Campaigns as a, a, a long-awaited follow-up. But I think it's fair to say quite a few unexpected life events took place in the last few By years. the digital version, folks, it'll save you a concussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there we go. So that's who I am. My, uh, my take on this debate, because I was actually in that video uh, that Annie hasn't seen, as I've just heard. So, uh, so was Jay and I, I think. 
Right. Um, I was actually, to much to my surprise, I have to say, I was in that video. I didn't know I was being filmed for that. Uh, and in fact, that was filmed for, crikey, 18 months ago or something. I was at a, a little event called Come and Have a Go If You Think You're Lard Enough, organised by Mark Backhouse and friends down in Southampton. And uh, I think Guy from Wargame Soldier and Strategy was there and just did a little kind of piece to camera with me out in the hallway uh say oh henry so what do you think about the state of historical war game do you think it's dying and to me naturally enough i said no i don't think so all the evidence i have in front of me is that it actually it surprisingly is in rude health so that was kind of my take on the thing and but what's happened has been extraordinary in the last kind of 24 48 hours this debate sort of mushroomed on twitter and lots and lots of people answers and of course it's it's one of those things where the the you know nothing's ever really got a simple answer and the and the actual answer that comes out of it all out of this morass of debate is well it depends <laughs> right because depending on who you are what background you've got what age group you are what your life has been like whether you've got kids or not all this kind of thing that's going to heavily influence your answer now i would say someone like me who's been in wargaming you know forever uh, so that's a scarily long time i've been in wargaming now isn't it it's like 50 years odd which is um appalling but in that time or impressive. <laughs> yeah, well, or impressive. You can, I should get an award. 50 years. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> you get your golden tape measure. I get my years. golden tape measure. I've been waiting for that. <laughs> my golden tape measure. Uh, my golden laser pointer, as it would now be. Um, but anyway, the, I think this is the thing that, uh, from my perspective, when I think back to when I were a lad, and yes, like you, my airfix soldiers on the, on the lounge carpet, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and to me it was it was toys but it was also but it was also military toys and for our generation i think we had this additional con connection that our parents had fought in the war or they'd been involved in the second world war in some way or another you know whether it was on the home front or you know my dad was in the fleet air arm and he was all over the place and eventually ended up in canada of all places my dad was nine so oh was he all right <laughs> So well, my parents were obviously older when they had me. But anyway, the fact is that that is influenced me enormously because when my dad, you know, I was born in 1961. My dad was a talented guy. He was a carpenter and a photographer and a bit of an artist. And he made models as well, most particularly. So when he got a son, it was like, oh, these relatively new airfix kits that were about at the time he made me all kinds of military aircraft that we'd hang from our bedroom ceiling and models of tanks and all that kind of stuff and ships and that was just part of not just my life but there was a whole generation of us who were surrounded by this kind of thing there was this explosion and that name that that company airfix is a key name certainly in the uk and, and i think the fact that the typical uk library at that time was full of books by Featherstone grant wise absolutely Libraries. You know, I, I, if I had a five for every time I'd take one of those out of our village library. Absolutely. Well, I'm just going to reach over to my left here because it's something I love to do. And here's a copy of Charles Grant's The War Game, published in 1971, because this is my old school uh, bookshelf right next to me here. And like you, I mean, this is an ex library book. You know, it's not actually the one I had on almost permanent Did you steal loan. it from the library? No, no, not this one. <laughs> Sadly, I didn't have my own copy this, until some this years later. This is all a setup from the library to get you to admit <laughs> that you've still got it. Quick, get him! Get him! Uh, up to I, the I think the fine would be more than my mortgage, mate. <laughs> so, uh, but I think this is the thing that, so from my point of view, when I think back to those days, Mike, when it was new and exciting and it was still a relatively new and exciting hobby but it was a hobby that required a lot of dedication you know it was really hard to find terrain it was hard enough to find the figures you know the ranges of figures available well let's be honest in military modeling magazine at the time there were constantly series of articles about how to convert your airfix confederates to 
to Ting Chinese or whatever it happened to be, right? Using plasticine and Jay were like this, banana oil to <laughs> thumbs up for Jay the story, the story I always tell on that score is my school war games club. We fought war games research group agents. Now, when you are 15, you cannot afford minifigs. Yeah. Uh, anything, and literally, I used to spend nights with a ruler and sheets of cardboard Ironing out, rect leaving out rectangles and going regular C, H, C. Yeah. Regular letter, letter. And, 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 but I mean, one of the things that that, that brings up, I was going to ask Jay particularly, because I know you don't have much of a club environment where you are, do you? Correct. Um, so how did you how did you get into wargaming? Where did, wh how did you get the greybeards? You know, did you have a set of greybeard, greybeards who introduced you to a hobby or... To be fair, where I'm living now is not where I first started working. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, I, you know, I, I started in the Kansas City area, which has a thriving gaming scene. And it started with a certain Christmas when my folks got me Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader and some Space Marines and Orcs and Space Pirates and just went from there. And I actually gamed with a couple of different groups of, of older gamers and here I was in junior high and looking back on it now I was surprised my mom and dad would drop it off with uh you know drop me off at basically some stranger's house <laughs> to, to push little figures around <coughs> excuse me so uh, so that's how I got my start is just being able to connect with people through the store where where I get stuff and going to conventions and finding out that they lived in maybe not the same town, but maybe the town over. And it was a relatively easy way to get, get over to them. So uh, that's where, that's where I started. And then when I went to the army, I was lucky enough to, there was a decent store next to Fort Bragg and was able to get all kinds of games in with those guys and just, and some of those, actually, some of those guys I still game with that I that I gamed with in in the army. So, interestingly, your entry point was not historicals. No, not at all. No. I, well, you know, I, I've got the at at one or two figures left of a matchbox set of half the four that I got when I was eight or nine. Oh, wow, <laughs> <laughs> I remember those. Um, because one of the things I, I've been discovering as a club chairman is we get an awful lot of people through the door who want to play 40k or War Machine or Kings of War. And two years later, I mean, to quote, to quote Tom, who's probably listening to this when it goes out, who's one of our, one of our club, club show committee members, he said to me when he was painting some sharp, sharp practice Napoleonics for me, that since he's been to the club, he's can't remember the last time he actually painted a set of figures without going to look up a historical uniform reference and he joined the club playing 40k as far as i can remember playing 40k and war machine so i know henry you got embroiled in a bit of a discussion on twitter about gatekeeping yeah and i think there's a degree to which i mean it, the club scene seems to be more a uk thing than a us thing mm. but well, i think well, there's certainly a duty I don't know if it's a duty, it's just something that I certainly feel we should do, that we should make all kinds of gaming available to people who join our clubs and yeah. encourage them to play things that they might step out of their comfort zone and play. Because you'd be amazed. I mean, we have a load of people who came, came as I said, joining to play fantasy sci-fi games who I can stick on a game if I ain't been shot mum or uh, Gary can stick on a game of Chain of Command. And mm -hmm. people who I knew, knew never had any intention of playing historical when they joined the club, mm. they're like a shot. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting um, because I, since school, uh, I've never been a member of a club. I've always been either a lone gamer playing solo or with friends or attending specific events like the War Games Holiday Centre, Don Featherstone Weekends, or organising big games like my huge imaginations games that I've been uh, putting on a, a, up in Aiton, you know. You say um, you're too cool, Henry. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't want to be a member of anything that wants to have me as a member, darling. Which, let's uh, face it. Why I join clubs. Which, <laughs> your your Aiton games do have quite a wide age range of players. Yeah, absolutely. We've got guys from, uh, you know, youngest guys uh, attended were like in their late 20s, right up to, you know, old kids like me and 
some older actually some you know well into retirement and i've always liked that you know and i've always seen that kind of diversity of age group as a real strength but i do accept you know because uh, annie earlier was talking about gatekeepers um i think the thing is because those of us who are very active online i think maybe particular on on twitter we see a huge diversity of stuff I think we, uh, you know, it's one of the things I'm, I commented is that, you know, it's one of the things I think is a, has been a massively surprising joy about our little corner of Twitter, whereas so much of Twitter is, you know, like a cesspit in so many ways with people, you know, just, and particularly nowadays with, you know, the way the country, well, the world has been going, uh, there's an awful lot of kind of, um, if we just kind of say grumbling going on out there. Whereas, uh, well, you could even just simply say well, politics. Absolutely. Whereas our little bit of Twitter, which is, you know, there's, it's not a real enclave. Anyone can, you know, bump into us if they want to, but fortunately they almost never seem to. But it's been an absolute, you know, a couple of years now, it's been an absolutely fantastically supportive place, a lovely corner of the internet. You know, I've earlier today, I just posted something, oh, I'm, you know, painting some more Bacchus Romans. I need a blue this time and this is what i've been doing and you get you know useful feedback or even if it's just people giving it a like but it just happens a lot you know you don't get people coming on there saying oh you stupid idiot you why aren't you using this <laughs> color instead anyone knows that romans in the year 43 a.d should definitely be using this dye in their clothing and therefore you should can only use that foundry color let's so here with tacitus and his pantone car absolutely <laughs> we just don't get that but i do accept there are places on the internet frequented by war gamers that uh, particularly in recent years have turned very toxic indeed and I can imagine anyone who turned up in you know the wrong place would probably run a mile absolutely that you know where you get the not just the button counters but you know like the grumbly old men in cardigans type people who just want everything to stay the same they want everything to stay exactly as it was you know when they were a lad and if it was good enough for them it's good enough for you and all that fantasy stuff and oh my goodness me you don't want women playing war games for goodness sake let let alone anyone who may be kind of gender neutral oh my god <laughs> we can't handle that kind of thing whereas and and of course you you do see it there are certain sections of the wider wargaming community that are it has to be said much more politically ferocious even which uh if you happen to stray into the wrong lane you know like on a, a large motorway you can suddenly think oh my god what have i stumbled across here that you know it can be scary for people who are just like i'm just here to have a nice time you know no nice times on the internet now <laughs> but, but but this is where of course you know input from people like annie is so important you know she and i have discussed stuff you know on my own podcast as well about this kind of topic and I know that there are, you know, there's a large chunk of the wargaming community who do just think, oh, I don't really want to think about that. I don't want to talk about that. But I think, you know, for those of us who have a more kind of prominent presence in the hobby, whether we like it or, or not, you know, once you get past a couple of thousand followers, you have to accept that there are people there who are kind of following you just to kind of see what you say about certain things, you know, uh, which I still think well, that's a bit weird, isn't it? But it's just yeah. a fact of life. It's it. Hey, guys, well, that's what it's, you're doing right now, Henry. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's the internet's right. So I think that we do have to be prepared to um, show leadership of one kind or another when these kind of topics arise. I think we do need to show some kind of leadership when subjects like gatekeeping come up, because I. You know, just as an ordinary bloke who just wants to have a nice, happy life and I want everyone else to have a nice, happy life, I just think it's really stupid that certain people are trying to say, oh, there, there are bits of this hobby which is about playing games with that, you know, this is the codex, this is what you should be doing, and all this other stuff. No, 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 you mustn't touch that. Now, whether that is youngsters coming into 
our hobby, whether it's people, you know, like, uh, like Ian, they're, you know, returning to the hobby after an interval, whether it's people who may not have considered our hobby at all. I just think it behoves us to put the best possible face on what we do because I want to have a nice time with nice people playing these lovely games and painting these wonderful figures that are produced for us. And why on earth wouldn't I want anyone else to have the same benefit? You know, I just think it's not rocket science here, Mike, is it? I just think it's like, be nice, isn't it? <laughs> Elon and Annie, you're both nodding sagely at this point. <laughs> want, to, uh, want to dive in? Um, it's okay if I... Yeah, yeah, yeah um, please. Yeah. Um, who was I? Sorry, I keep getting these brain blanks. Um, <laughs> yes, so what Henry was saying about that sort of like dusty, I would say not Cardigan Brigade, because I am a fan of cardigans. So I won't, <laughs> <laughs> won't anger the Cardigan Brigade. But that's what that's the image I had of historical wargaming. So I've had quite a different um, experience to all, all of you. Hello. Ah. Uh, in that I came from, well, I came from fantasy, but a lot later. Mm. And the internet was a, a whole big thing then. So not when I started, but what, by the time I'd sort of found historical wargaming, there was the internet, but I was still like, Ugh. and maybe I think clubs are so good for that because I joined a club. All I knew was Warhammer and Warhammer 40K and you know Blood Bowl because I just hadn't come across anything else. So once I started going to a gaming shop that's got, so it was Firestorm and Cardiff and there's people playing all sorts and then you just like, so that must be what happens at your club, where they kind of go, oh, oh different sizes, <laughs> different history, what? And it was Colours was the first trade show I went to as a, as a punter. And yeah, it was still just like, and that's where I got into Saga, because I went with a bunch of friends, and the Leicester guys had set up the whole, you know, the Great Hall and the bow and the funky dice. And it's like, this just looks really cool. Let's do that. Um, and once I started playing quite a few different games around those sort of years where I was at Firestorm, I always credit to Mr. Mike Hobbs. <laughs> um, he he was just such a good sort of ambassador because I was so afraid of getting everything wrong. And then to play and, and just some other people around there and sort of find the, the good ones <laughs> and go, oh, this is really welcoming. And I think for a little while, I kind of... Um, pretended that I knew what was going on a lot of the time <laughs> and because it's a lot of the stuff you know that's a whole other discussion about that sort of generational how much you're taught history I have so many massive history gaps I've been on a mission the last few years to really like teach myself history because nobody else seems to have so um I was worried about looking like an idiot basically mm -hmm. and just looking like oh well this person kind of doing it oh, she's painted yeah. that brown mm -hmm. <laughs> and the first saga figures I painted I was still like is this the right brown? I don't know. That's, uh, and obviously not. <laughs> just paint it brown. It's fine. <laughs> it's brown. fine. Take, um, take, a look, take a look at the nice pile of dyes, dy sample dyed things there are around the bay. Yeah, I was like, it has to be a happy range of colours. Yeah, that's like, it has to be perfect. Oh, no. Um, and it's to discover that people aren't like that. And obviously, again, obviously they are, but not everybody. And that sort of opened up this, this whole other world. And mm. like, I've now uh, it's kind of led to me setting up the company because at the time I went, oh, Saga, yes, sure. Oh, we could have some women shield main. Oh, oh, they don't exist at all. Oh, okay. Uh, at least they um, do. Oh, my goodness, what is she yeah, wearing? Yeah, I'm sure that's definitely not historical. It also um, looks very cold. But, but I've, I've kind of gone from, from one end to the other in terms of just being fully converted into that historical side of things. And yeah, just to discover things like, so from the point where I started say, playing Saga, it can go online, go, hello, saga.com or whatever, you know, look through Google and you find your groups and all that. And it's really easy to then meet people. And even if it's online, get to that sort of community going. Whereas in the past, you're very based on what your, you know, your small friend group is playing because you have to. And you can go, oh, there's all this going on. Oh, this new game. There's always a Facebook group for it. Oh, and yeah. then you can kind of tailor where you go because there will be some, there have been plenty of places online where they have kind of gone, shoo, woman, or that sort of um, never ending storybook guy with like, well, you don't, no, 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 out you go, not doing it properly. But there's plenty of places, and that's why I absolutely love Twitter, which is, say, so what Henry mm. was saying, that it's just this huge mash of people that might not have met 
just you know in, in ordinary circumstances that you just wouldn't mm. just you know your social groups might not have mixed or anything but all sort of brought together from the gaming mm. and um, people do because like some of the stuff henry's painting these little things i don't know what they're for but <laughs> like, they're cool and just sharing everything that you're doing you're kind of just exposed to so much more and and then if that does pique your particular like oh oh what's this so it's just really sharing whereas before it probably was almost this kind of secret society type so you... um, yeah I just can I just interject here Mike because I think one of the things is interesting and this is where um, our age difference becomes apparent of course is that for a long time uh, the hobby for me, in fact, was kind of defined by whatever was going on in the magazines. You know, back in the day, you know, there was military modelling to start with in Battle for War Gamers and then uh, uh, um, uh, Practical War Gamer and um, Miniature War Games came out and then Duncan McFarlane went off with War Games Illustrated for a long time, right through to, let's be honest, the mid-1990s the war game community was kind of defined by whatever was in the magazines. Uh, one of the things that someone raised the other day that's so amazing on Twitter, uh, for example, you can say, you know, just, just do a little post saying, oh, I'm, I'm painting some, you know, AD 43 Romans. Can anyone, you know, give me some idea of what colour leather they would probably have? Within a couple of minutes, you'll probably have half a dozen answers. It's absolutely extraordinary. Now, when I were a lad, and others of us may remember this, you'd have to write off to the editor of Military Modelling Magazine or whatever, <laughs> to the letters page, and hope that sometime in the next few months you might get an answer, right? Uh, often that answer might be, oh, yes, you need to buy this really expensive book that's only available from antiquarian book dealers and will cost you 150 quid, right? Whereas now... You know, people will say, oh, look, I've, I've, because I know I do it myself. Oh, look, I've got an Osprey book on that. You know, how about this? Try that. Some, someone's painted, oh, God, Jim Ibbotson's painted some absolutely exquisite Romans in 28 millimeter that look completely now. lifelike. And, uh, well, have a look at what he sounds like. Just amazing. Now, that is an extraordinary thing that then, you know, when I started, I designed my first website in 1996, I set up Battle Games as my first hobby website in nine, when it was a website, not a blog. No one had blogs back then. 1998, I started Battle Games as a website. And th that was, along with the other place we're not mentioning today and a couple of other people who were <laughs> early adopters online, we suddenly... It was extraordinary to those of us who built websites back then that suddenly we got emails from people. We got emails from people all over the world. It was like, why does someone in Lithuania want to talk to me? <laughs> Oh, they're a war gamer. And it turns out, what, they're, like me, they're going, oh my God, there's someone else out there. It's like, it's like SETI, the search for extraterrestrial <laughs> life. <laughs> right? You know, it's, oh my God, there's other people out there. Now we so take that for granted. I mean, here we are on Zoom talking to people. You know, there's a couple of you guys over there in the States and what have you. We're making friends with people all over the, the world. We're exchanging information. And that has been utterly transformative to those of us who participate in the hobby and have got, you know, half a brain and want to participate in this kind of stuff. It's, you know, here we are in the middle of a COVID pandemic. I don't have to worry about going to my local shop and should I wear a mask or not. I can buy anything I want from anywhere on the world online. Thanks, Henry. In <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Including <laughs> superb products from Bad Squido Games, folks. Unless, so unless, of, unless, of course, backers are having one of those weeks when they're not. <laughs> I'm one of the people waiting for some backers stuff. You bless bless right. their heart. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that just yeah. one of the things that, you know, when this question comes up, is historical wargaming dying? I think, I don't know how much you said before I, I came on online there, but one of the people who said, oh, you know, we should be careful, Jasper Orthoy of course of uh, Wargame Soldier and Strategy Magazine because they run their great wargaming survey and apparently the statistics they're getting back from a sample of how many people do their survey several thousand people anyway isn't it it's he's seeing that as an age group we are aging 
right? And the demographic of, of historical war gamers is gradually getting older. Now, we have to be really careful about polls and surveys, of course, because it's self-selecting data. You get the data from the people who said, yeah, I'll fill in that survey. Yeah. And my, they're aware of miniature war games. And, and aware of, but then yeah, I think of my godson and his friend who I've introduced to both fantasy and historical war gaming now. Are they the kind of kids who would ever do an online survey? They're like, nah, I can't be bothered with that. Just want to get on and play the game. So. Right. Dipping in here, um, one of the on, I had noted. Um, yeah, it is my it is my show. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, uh, one of the things I had noticed is that an awful lot of the younger members of our club don't buy the mags. Yes, and therefore there's a there's a massive there's an in, inherent self selection in that, and, and, and I'm wondering if that's because there is a perception that the mags foster to a, an extent a side of the hobby that they're less interested in. I know very few people in my sort of age group that get any of those sort of mags other than White Dwarf, which is sort of mm. in a different world. Yeah. Had Wargame Soldier and Strategy come today. My housemate's a Wargamer, so I went, look, it's a magazine. <laughs> 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 he hadn't read one of those before. And I, I don't think, and I, we're more of that. Yeah, there's, I think you buy a lot of magazines from habit because you that was always how it was. Whereas now, you know, there's a lot of, well, there's, I can get all this stuff online. Mm, so yeah. there's less of a, one of the things I was I was picking up from something Annie said, and, and I think Henry touched on, um, there's the you know back in the day it was the magazines, and the, there's been a phase where I think it's been a combination of what's on at shows, and what's on Twitter, and what the likes of Jay and Neil and Mike and and the rest of us uh, Meeples and other podcasts have been focusing on, because you'd find we I'm sure you found it too, Jay you'd talk about Chain of Command. And there'd be a lot of traffic about Chain of Command. And the other thing I'd noted is is shows over here seem to have been tending away from look at the backs of the people who are playing a demo game. Yeah, yeah. Which it used to be a lot over here. And I know at Harrywood we've tried very hard to encourage people to run inclusive participation games. Mm -hmm. And something I want both Jay and Ilan to speak on, as they're more familiar with the US side of the shows, is my perception from going to Historicon was that the games were a lot more participatory and a lot more welcoming, even if they were historical. Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, I, just listening to this conversation, I'm struck by uh, a number of pretty profound cultural differences here, right? Like, I mean, not the least of which is that I, I've heard people talk about Airfix and I've seen boxes of them, but they were never part of my youth. Um, I don't know about Jay, if that's the case for you, but like we had toy soldiers that we made up our own games with, but not like the ranges were very limited. There was medieval and civil war period. And that was it. Mm. Um, and then there was no magazines. Like, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Like at the, every once in a while, I stumbled across a, like an old one. And I worked for the biggest game store on the East coast mm -hmm. um, when I was a teenager. And every once in a while, like what, like a British magazine would come through and we'd all be like, Ooh, what is this thing? <laughs> You know, but like it just was not the case at all. And I'll just throw in there also, like I love the idea and I do see it here in, in our local HMGS, um, of which I'm a part and, and I was part of the leadership for a little bit. Um, I do see younger people coming in, having played a different game and, and growing into something else. But largely that is not the case in my experience. Largely in my experience, what happens is that like I'll throw, if I put on a tournament that is using a historical rule set, it's a it's a convention, so I'm going to make sure all the stuff is painted, and I'm going to use all the context that I have, and I've not been bad at that, which means that I get like sometimes 20, 22 people in the tournament, mm -hmm. which is the biggest miniatures event of the con, the one that I was running for a while. Just next to us are the 40K people, um, who, who, uh, whose stuff is largely not painted, and while we might go over and look at their table, they will never come over. And the Warhammer Fantasy people would never come over, never ask questions. And the Kings of War people, as I've gone out to other clubs and tried to like, hey, my name's Elon, I have some stuff. I'm going to do Kingdoms of Men because I have these pikemen. Um, when I say like, oh, yeah, I love a bunch of other games, there, it, there's just a, a strong disconnect where they like blink twice and they're like, okay, but it's my turn, right? And they, and so... Um, <laughs> Uh, like, and, and it could be that I'm too much, like I, I've always been a little bit extra where I'm like, hey, how about those 15 millimeters and I'm turning my 10 millimeter GPA, because what the fuck? Um, but, the, um, 
but I don't think I'm that way. I think I'm gentle in my way of just like, hey, there's some other games. Like, I wonder if you guys ever tried some of the, um, some Warlord stuff and, and they just like are not interested whatsoever. And so what we get here is a bunch of like, for the short amount of time I was playing both action, of course with painted miniatures because I was playing at conventions, mm. I was facing a bunch of unpainted stuffs, often without heads or arms. Oh. Um, and every, every soldier I was fighting against was a German with an assault rifle because mm. that's the way you spam it, right? Mm. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this language, but the, mm. the choose the thing that breaks the game and then spam it until yeah. they change the game to let you not do it. That's mm. an attitude that I think really comes from some of those games mm -hmm. um, that makes it very hard for people to change over because they're not, they're interested mm. in, in um, that power fantasy as opposed to in like what a fun game is. And so that's a long way of saying that the culture seems very different to me and the way that you're talking about uh, gaming and your clubs, that, that doesn't seem to be my experience here very much. Mm. What about you, Jay? Um, it's, if I ever game with other people, it's, at, it's in a convention setting and for the most part, it's at the recruit show. Um, which I've talked about many, many times on, on my podcast, but you know, I'm it's trying to get you more listeners. So keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, recruits is held at a, at Lee Summit high school, just outside of Kansas city. The guy who organizes it is a history teacher there at Lee Summit high. And it's actually run by their uh, student gaming group. And it started out as a fundraiser for, for the, the school game club and you've got everything everything historical fantasy science fiction board gaming role playing miniatures games the the whole lot dba tournaments um for historicals there's bolt action tournaments there's uh flames of war what's that flames of war probably oh, yeah flames of war 40k age of sigmar warm of hordes all that um, actually, Dwayne, the, the chief organizer, he's big into the uh, Lord of the Rings game from GW. So he, he hosts a Lord of the Rings tournament as well. But um, one of the good things about that is that there are so many younger kids there, you know, high school, junior high age kids, and they're getting exposed to everything at that show. And so all the tournament organizers are very – very emphatic you know don't don't show up with you know don't show up with unpainted figures and so everyone's putting their best foot forward everyone is uh trying to put on a a good production for you know for you know the target audience the target audience is you know our next generation of gamers uh as far as gaming i've witnessed in shops and whatnot that i go into yeah i mean it's exactly what elon's talking about uh oh there's a note here from henry <laughs> I'm not reading that very well at this stage. All right. Well, I'll tell you. Should I just. <laughs> I, I was just a note for Mike because so, it's a topic that I think we ought to bring up is uh, uh, one of the difficulties of entry into historical gaming is we tend not to use army lists. We tend to say, actually, we've done our own research into this historical period right. as opposed to other gaming systems, particularly fantasy and sci fi. That's it. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I, I think that. One of the, it, it was like mentioned earlier, like Elon was saying about how there's a reliance on certain, you know, pretty much all the fantasy or science fiction games and certain historical or history light games, if you want to use a vaguely pejorative term, uh, with army lists. And like you said, you know, every German's got an assault rifle, which, yeah. oh, okay, I mean, I guess. It just doesn't that, look like Saving Private Ryan. Right, and I think that there's there's some there's some ground to be gained by putting forward attractive looking, and there's there's a balance you have to strike between an attractive looking game and an and an attainable game for someone coming in. Um, you know that example of that chain of command game, Henry from St that was set in Stalingrad. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> and the average person walking up is going to realize, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I wonder if there's some ground to be gained with uh, with some attainable looking games with approachable rules, which is one of the reasons why I love running what a tanker at <laughs> at recruits um, because it is pretty pretty you know they know their onions you know the the lardies you know they know what they're talking about and you know it's you can jump right into it it's not hard to get into into that game and if i guess if you do want to have a bunch of tigers going up against a bunch of is2s you could <laughs> but i've i've i have a lot of fun with uh you know shermans and panzer fours also yeah i mean one of the things that i think we as a club try and do and i think it's something that i think we need to be aware of is that the likes you can be as historically snobbish as you like about games like bolt action and flames of war and saga but they are if nothing else a gateway mm. and if that's what gets people having fun with history painting historical figures there's nothing to stop you sidling up to them a little bit later and say you know there's figures you've got for bolt action i've got this game you might like to try mm. um, yeah i got I think that's absolutely kind of, and I, I'm cutting in line in front of Andy, so I apologize. But I'll, but I think it, they're a great gateway if the gateway happens, which doesn't always seem to be the way in the states. And I'll just throw out there also that recently my friend who did his last degree at Royal Hallway explained to me what you all mean in England by a demonstration game, and my <laughs> mouth was hanging open. I was just like, "Well, like you don't get to play, yeah, you just I, watch." I, I, <laughs> And I refer you to my earlier comment about watching yeah. historical war gamers. <laughs> no, I've never done that. Yeah, here, when you hear it at a convention, every time that I hear it's a demo game, what means is that, like, your, um, that your French cavalry are right about to charge the Ingr English line of billmen. And, uh, like, you, the, it's set up right where the action is going to happen, and you'll play a half hour with the person who represents the company or, like, is really trying to make it, mm. like, build some momentum for the game. And you'll play a half hour in order to demonstrate how the rules work. The and then you'll it. leave and somebody else will cycle in to, like, figure it out. Mm. That, I've never heard of, like, here, I don't know about you, Jay, but I've never heard of a demo game where you're just sitting and watching, like, with your hands in your lap. Yeah. I, don't, I don't even know how that works. At, at recruits, there are a couple of um, very serious war gamers, and they do. It looks like you're drinking moonshine, Elon, which I highly, uh, <laughs> highly encourage. But uh, it's the U.S. <laughs> uh, remind me to tell you about uh, some guys I know from Long Beach. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm in Long Beach, California. That's why. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a. Uh, you know, some, some established Kansas City area clubs put on some really nice looking games. Some of them are pretty heavy rules wise, but the understanding is, you know, no matter how many people you have from your club to play, you have to leave slots open for the attendees. And so, you know, I've, I've seen games that are as light as what a tanker and the uh, tanks you know, I, I think that's the name of it. It's the other single tank duel game uh, yeah. from Gale Force Nine. It's, it's flames of flames of war tank combat light. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and stuff as heavy as Empire Three, and everything in between. So I, I think it's incumbent upon us in the hobby if we are going to go into public, we do need to be open to inviting new people to play with us and having a good time and, tr and trying to interact and, you know, put our best foot forward, you know, have a good looking table. It doesn't have to be, you know, golden demon or photograph ready, no. but it does have to look decent. It has to represent, you know, the hobby. And, and I've said this many, many times that what's great about our hobby is that there is something for everybody. If you're a model maker, mm -hmm. awesome. If you prefer painting, great. If you prefer the research aspect, awesome. And every so often, there's those groups that get really high class or high quality painters and high quality train makers and high quality games designers and high quality researchers and all comes together and they make dynamite. And sometimes you get people that just have, you know, painted stuff and it's good enough and that's great too. And sometimes it's in the mindset of the people running the game. I mean, I, one of our most madly popular games at Harrywood a couple of years ago involved about half a dozen Playmobil Viking longships. 
<laughs> and everybody loved it. But uh, what I was going to do it was going to point out um, something Elan said. Um, what we, what you obviously call a demo, a, uh, a show game, we call a participation game. And if I can quote what we say now on Herowood's, not that we got to do it this year, um, the game application form, we would like Herowood's focus to be predominantly letting people have a go. This means that we will, in the event we have more entries than we can fit in our available space, give preference to games which are full on participation or hands on demos. In short, we'd like people to get involved rather than watch you play. If your game doesn't have obviously fit the above criteria, we reserve the right to put you on a waiting list, and I have in the past. <laughs> and it, I... Interesting. Sorry, Mark, go on. I, I, I get the impression that that moves us a lot closer to the way games at places like Historicon and um, Recruit actually work. Mm. I just wanted to interject, Mike, that, uh, of course, the Partisan show here has made that change where it's now got a really good That's balance between... Think, uh, and Yeah, Hammerhead. Of course, Hammerhead's all participation, isn't yeah. it? Uh, and Partisan, Partisan's gone at least 50-50 participation and demonstration and also I, I, has clearly drawn the <laughs> so if you know you yeah. want a participation game you know which half of the hall it's in yes absolutely yes it's, it's literally uh, there's a, a line down the middle uh Ila, i think you know you've made some great points there the, about cultural difference and it is fascinating isn't it i mean mike because you're in the club scene and you've been involved in putting on games for a long time i've put on a few uh but it, it is an interesting aspect of the british uh uh, wargaming culture is it because as we often hear that you know british war game shows certainly until fairly recently were almost like 10 a penny you know you could do two or three in a weekend if you really wanted to sometimes when it was a crowded part of the calendar whereas of course in the states your distances are just you know times 10 so whereas someone here might think oh i think there's a war game show on down the road i'll just pop down there for half an hour do a bit of shopping and see what games are, are being put on and the demo game, there's something about the kind of diorama model railway thing kind of as part of our culture there as well, I think. You know, partly, and it's interesting, isn't it? What I mentioned about the magazines, that the first magazine that even talked about wargaming, you know, a magazine that was on the newsstands, was Military Modelling Magazine, which was all about dioramas and fabulous painting techniques and all that kind of stuff and so i certainly think that for a generation of war gamers that kind of stuck with us whereas there's another generation come along where you know it's white dwarf you know largely that's been their their source material for you know the modeling the painting and all the fluff that goes with it so i think the demonstration guy game in a sense has a proud history and when it's done well it i think a good demo game does have that wow factor it you do stand there going, wow how have they managed to build that replica of stalingrad with a million bricks you know oh. how have they managed to do that world war one trench system how have they managed to do that invasion of Pewley or, or whatever it was that your guys put on there, Mike, you know. I think there is something... That was that was not us, I think. That was Tim Whitworth's lock. Oh, was it? Right. We're we were doing part. the big mad Omaha Beach game at the oh, same right. time. That's right. Uh, Omaha Ooh. Beach. But it was, you know, there are games that I can remember over the years that have just been, wow, I'm really glad I went to the show and just saw that. And when it's done well, they don't have their backs to the audience no, and that's when it's done well they are a pro you know would you like us to tell you how we made that mountain would you like us think of people like james morris for example yeah. who's put on some extraordinary games over the years the guy's a teacher and he's fantastic at explaining to people he's so enthusiastic you know he's a real brilliant ambassador for the hobby and i think that's the thing that the great demo games i've seen over the years there have been people there who actually haven't done any playing themselves they spent the entire day talking to audience members and going home with no voice left <laughs> if you remember if you remember our big man dan busters game yes we yes, had yes, yes. We, five people running that game and two of them were just there to talk to the queue yes absolutely you know even the old school games i put on you know molvitz and sitting bad and that kind of stuff I didn't, oh yeah, the first one, Molvitz, I did get to play sitting bed. I didn't play at all. I was just kind of the PR guy, right? And I think a good demo game, you do, you, you, it's not a club night. You're not there to just play your own game, right? 
So I think it's when it's done well, it's not a bad thing, Elan, but I think increasingly people are now coming to shows and thinking, I don't just want to look at those pretty toys. I want to play with them. And I why not? Poll. I ran a poll in my blog a couple of years ago. Yeah. And the overwhelming reaction was the two things people came to shows were, were to actually roll dice and to handle stuff on the trade stalls that they can't see properly, which I think Annie will probably relate to. Yeah. Yes. Um, going back a little bit, those um, backs of people on the on the playing playing the tables. I've had many an experience where I've sort of walked along and gone, "Oh, this looks interesting," oh, and they've sort of turned away from you even further, <laughs> like, yeah. "Oh, oh, okay." And I'm sure there's a large crossover that's almost like that with the people that go young and aren't into it these days. Yeah. They're like, "Come here, show me, tell me the things." But then I've had that, Annie, when I've been there <laughs> conspicuously in my Battle Games t-shirt with a huge so go, it's Henry. around my neck. It's Henry, <laughs> quick. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hello, I'm here for you to tell me about your stuff so I can put it in my magazine. Oh. And it's like, oh, no, we don't want that. Oh. With, the, um, with the sort of accessibility, um, I think that a bit sort of what we were saying before, like me coming to... to um, historical war games i went straight and bought at the, i don't think they do it at the moment but grip and beast did a sort of saga paint kit and they were all just i think it was vallejo um, but say so, say so it was vallejo um, but yeah it was the, like this is a pre-selected bunch of stuff you can't go wrong with and they're all existing colors i believe just sort of named slightly for a fancy pack but just to be able to go that that pack of stuff yeah, you can't really go wrong with those colours. That choice is made for you. Mm. And I know some people also go, oh, it's all dumbing it down. But the more that can get people into it. So I found that with and then World War Two. It's like, which of the many drabs do I paint this? But you can just buy, you know, Soviet kit. Warlord will kit. sell you the yeah. British Army paint kit. Yeah, and I think <laughs> yeah. when you get sort of younger people that are coming from, from Warhammer and that sort of background, like myself, you're kind of used to that. And I know some, again, some will go, oh, spoon feeding. But you kind of go, right, what do I need? And when you mm -hmm. just have all of these individual products, you're like, I don't know what I actually mm -hmm. need. So it goes, this is your starter box. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, so the more you can, you can kind of just pick a couple of items off a shelf and go, that's mm -hmm. enough to get playing with. Then that's so that's obviously better with those sort of simpler games. Yeah, it's part you don't have to do all of that research beforehand, but it gets you started, and then you research as you go along. And yeah, and you, you're trying to get people on that route from standing there wide eyed in front of your stall, or yeah, yeah, just go to that table over that starting ground table over there. And if you can show them at least the first steps on the path, yeah, mm. it's a little, little bit of help. But I've, so I'm a, I'm a good example because I've gone from that pure fantasy with specific historical interests. It's not like I had zero when I came to it, but through the hobby and through through the industry, I guess. But it would have I feel it would have been the same even if I hadn't started Bad Squiddo. I've got so much more interested in different periods of history because it's almost like there's a, a purpose to researching them because there's an end point. So, you know, if you're studying university and stuff like that, you've got your project and there's an essay or something, there's an end point. Whereas I think a lot of people aren't so used to just learning and there's nothing to sort of put those newfound skills into. Yeah, yeah. And I like learning stuff and then doing something with it because it sticks it in your mind. So I, I, talk, I talk a lot about the, you know, the women from history and things like that because it really mm. helps me. So the more I do, yeah. <laughs> do that talk, it stays in. And I am just totally converted. So I, still my biggest example is that i had next to no interest in world war ii five years mm. ago and now all of my spare time is learning about world war ii yeah. and trying to, try to catch up with everyone and that's <laughs> entirely through the hobby and that's that was quite a hard conversion and i think mm. being female is a is a whole other coming it to a different sort of mm. angle because i've not had that you know, when you're a young boy, you kind of get army thrown at you a lot. And it's all army toys and army stuff and mm. that like son, dad, army thing. Whereas it's always like, no, 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 little teapots and stuff. So <laughs> I found myself sort of like way behind in that sort of like development of learning that sort of stuff. And it's yeah. really, there is a bit of a wall in this like, oh, this is not for you. Um, yeah. Just in general, like that sort of culture, not yeah. the wargaming, just that sort of historically yeah. sort of thing. Well, so... 
sorry, was Elan tr trying to say something there? Yes, yeah, yeah but, I mean, I'm getting, I, no, 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 it's okay. I'm getting, like, thoughts are percolating and they're kind of, yeah. they're, they're tangentially related to what you're saying, yeah. I guess. And I guess because I, you know, I um, worked in that game store and I was around historical miniatures a lot. Um, but I wasn't, I guess you would say I wasn't a historical miniature gamer because I was largely playing Dungeons and Dragons when I was very young. And then um, somebody, it wasn't until I moved to California and I was doing some historical reenactment that somebody showed me Debellus Antiquitatis. But even after that, I, I was I had a hard time playing. So my real, like, I bought a bag of Old Glory Celts because I wanted to do a historical role playing with Harnmaster. And those were the first mm. miniatures I play, painted, but it wasn't until I did wow. uh, Warhammer Fantasy that I really started like, where in Army stopped being like the seven dwarves I had, right? <laughs> and started being like actually more. <laughs> But I wonder, so, so Annie, when you were talking, I was thinking about this, like just in terms of the framing of this conversation, which is like whether historical miniatures is dying out and to what extent um, the departure of fantasy miniatures from history plays a part in that. Because if you, if you, it sounds like maybe our timelines overlap a little bit just because I came to it late, but like when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons, all those early Raphim and uh, Ralph Partha figures were basically like medieval people yeah. and monsters. And so I can't say that it wasn't historical because it was like knights, a hundred percent. And then when I started playing Warhammer Fantasy, obviously the Perry's like the empire stuff was so like, it was basically the 16th century plus, you know what I mean? Um, to the point where some are kicking around in my in my Lawns Connect army right now, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but that, like, Age of Sigmar, I think, ended that in yeah, a lot of ways. That's, and, yeah, there's and, not a relation quite so much. Yeah. That's all, yeah. Age of Sigmar's almost, like, sci-fi to some... It's yeah, quite but far also, removed. But, like, yeah. but in the realm of sci-fi, 40K used to have some real, like, weird World War One references. Yeah, didn't yeah. It? it was like, there would almost be, that was the gateway, right? Like if you really liked the Empire and Warhammer Fantasy and somebody was like, eh, look at all these, like from mm. War Games Foundry, you'd be like, yeah, that's everything I ever yeah. wanted. Or like if you were playing 40K and somebody was like, what about World War One, 100%? Look at, like, look at these tanks from World War One. Like somebody would just be like, that's what I liked the whole time. Whereas they did now, that I'm with not me, sure. where, um, yeah, where it was like, Hey, these these empire figures. These were all also sculpted by these guys. These yeah, are yeah. Perry miniatures. And yeah, yeah, and and then it was a bit of a crossover with people using proxies, which is something you can't do so much now because of the sort of unique IP of GW. Right. But you'd have people who'd yeah have empire armies made out of Perry miniatures and mm. uh, oh yeah bits like that. Yeah. So you'd kind of go, you get how like, many like for this King's much? War oh. armies almost entirely Roman. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they got me from that, and then. I've still never played any Wars of the Roses game. I can't remember what I was even starting it to, mm. to play, but I've had this Wars of the Roses army for about 10 years. I finally sold it when I moved to, to Nottingham. I went, if I do finally do this, I'm going to start again. Cause this is... But that was stopping me because I kept going... I really wanted it to be really accurate, but it just became a barrier with that. Because I was like, well, mm. with that guy... You know, when you're painting all the... I can't remember what it's called. All your, all your different... Um, Heraldry. and things yeah. yeah and like oh with that guy have that with that and hang on i need mm. to read and <laughs> that but shelf it... there is almost entirely perry's blue war of the roses box yeah. unpainted. they're so good though yeah, um, yeah. yeah that, they, they were yeah. very good <laughs> crossovers when you have got things like oh they're yeah. the same sculptors so you're like oh yeah. oh yeah i think we do need to acknowledge the role of war games foundry here don't we because it was it's that same bunch of guys, you know, Alan and Michael Perry and a couple of others, you know, producing that stuff for years. And the other person whose name I must mention is Kevin Dallimore, the painter, because Kevin Dallimore showed people how you could take what were mostly considered astonishing fantasy and sci-fi painting techniques and apply them to historicals. He did two books about it, you know, under the Foundry label. And also War Games Foundry, as far as I can recall, uh, maybe Humbrol did it 
many, many years ago when we were still all using enamel paints. But those foundry paint sets of French infantry, you know, French chasseurs, British infantry, you know, the triads, yes, which I've got yes. a whole drawer full over the air. In fact, I've just been using some. And they were around going back to the kind of, what would it be, the, the mid-1980s, because, of course, they were being publicised in what was then the new War Games Illustrated magazine under Duncan McFarlane. It's the Nottingham Connections, guys. Yeah. All this stuff happening in Nottingham uh you know it's a subject for a podcast in itself which, which it? sadly of course doesn't help our American art of the <laughs> it doesn't you guys do you Jay do you guys actually get access to things like Foundry and the Perrys over there or oh absolutely um there's there's a couple different distributors for Foundry stuff um definitely for Perry stuff uh Lawn and Brigade carries uh carries the fairy stuff for example uh, artisan you know I've, I've recently got some artisan uh bonds connects so yeah i mean we we have access to that stuff i mean yeah there's a pond in the way but it's it's not that big a deal um, <laughs> it, feel, it feels like oh, sorry go ahead please no go on it's, you've got the floor well, Ellen. <laughs> it, it, Jay, it feels like a big deal to me i guess the um like at the local store when before the current kerfuffle um like i could find perry boxes and that was awesome and I, the perrys are my favorite sculptors so i'm happy but um i i like i like the old perry foundry stuff and i'm building a biblical like egyptian i'm uh, various stuff and it just is a like you can't buy it at any store around here. And then ordering in the mail, it seems like the the price for the shipping plus the the yeah. miniatures themselves are so expensive. And that that might be the same in England right now. But um, I find it very difficult to build it, to to really rely on founders. But right. and I always am. <laughs> and, and I guess I'll have to double check. But I think I think an outfit there in Wisconsin called Badger Games maybe they do a lot. They, yeah, they get a lot in. Um, yeah, the, the availability of things is very much based on what the particular company, what sort of retail distribution right. they've got. So Lon at Brigade and North Star have got a very close relationship. Right. North Star are distributors mm. as well, so they distribute the Perry. Um, so it's down to the company how far and wide they want things. So I've never actually seen Foundry sold by anywhere else. It obviously is, but say, because I, I use, it's a bit of a sub topic but I quite like the sort of nitty gritty bits of it um, but so yeah so I distribute for, via North Star but also directly to some retailers as well because my attitude is generally just get it everywhere <laughs> so generally but North Star are the big the big ones for it especially the historical so if something's carried by North Star you'll find way more shops have it which is why I went, yes, North Star distributing my things, which is ace. Um, because they can, yeah, their shops, say they don't stock any Perry, for example, and they stock some bits and bobs, but you go in there and go, oh, can you get Perry? They go, yes, I can order it in. But if you haven't got that sort of account, you can't then set something up to get a, that right. sort of thing. So it's a bit and of a side tangent, but yeah, it's, it's all dependent on how, how different businesses operate because some there are some that are still absolutely direct only mm. and then it goes as far up to some which are almost like they barely handle their own sales so just go oh, distributor you do it which I'm a bit right. jealous say, Joy? Uh, one of the problems with some of the friendly local game stores uh, in our immediate area in my immediate area anyway one in particular that i go to in springfield is you know even with getting something like the perry stuff you know their distributor may or may not have it. So then they got to wait to put together a full trade order. And, and that, that's a significant issue. So when you do have a company in the United States like Brigade and Lon Weiss, who are bringing in stuff alongside, you know, North Star, that, that's a godsend. In larger amounts as well, obviously, yeah. so it's good. And, I'm and spoiled because I, I can just walk to North Star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's all right for some. Yeah, right, I know. Um, we have we have rather worryingly overflowed the time slot. I was expecting this talk to take up, but I probably shouldn't have been surprised. You did have me and Henry on it, who were like <laughs> well, yeah. double trouble <laughs> of monologues. Can, can we possibly spend five minutes wrapping up? I know, Henry. I think you're constrained to leaving about nine, aren't you, Henry? So yeah, that's, I'm all right at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> Start, start with Jay, I guess. Is historical wargaming on the way out? Here's 
here's my thought. I think that historical wargaming is changing. I think that just simply the fact that, you know, people like Lon are saying, no, I'm selling loads of historical stuff um, is evidence enough that no, it's not dying or de declining. The fact that I can go, well, when we still had a, uh, when we still had a, an independent bookstore in Quincy, Illinois, a town with 40,000 residents, and I could get War Game Soldiers and Strategy Magazine at it, and I mm -hmm. could get Battle Games Magazine if you were calling me sending you pictures, Henry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I can get it at the Barnes & Noble in, in Springfield, Illinois. I think that says a lot. I think the fact that, you know, just looking at my own stats for my for my podcast, and I have downloads from you know, uh, many, many different countries that you wouldn't otherwise consider, you know, case in point, you know, let's take a look, Poland, Republic of Korea, Taiwan, Oman, Mexico, Thailand, Switzerland, and these are all in the bottom, you know, 25 through 50, Barbados, Indonesia, Ukraine, Georgia. I mean, it's out there. People are, people are taking in content from all over. I think the World Wide Web is helping with that. We just discussed, you know, a couple different com companies that not too long ago, there was no way you'd be able to get the stuff in the United States with any regularity. Mm. Um, I just think the face of the, of the hobby is changing and, you know, adapt or die. Mm. Annie? Um, I definitely don't think it's dying. I'm very excited and infused by historical wargaming and I'm a young person. Um, uh, I just think it is, it's getting, it's getting bigger and thus it's less, um, what's the word, the channel sort of spreading out, um, different things are happening but that's all very good and it's just changing um, and that's, that's not always a bad thing either. More and more people are getting into the hobby, it's getting more welcoming, um, part of what I do in my life and job, but my job is life because I'm one with Bad Squid Oak, um, is to try and make it friendlier, more welcoming, to get more and more people into this. I'm really trying to bridge the gap between that sort of nervous, historically wargaming, interested person and the veterans and trying to do all that and the internet's awesome and that's why I'm good friends with people like Henry that I'll hang out with and chat to which it's not like it's just me and the kids, me and the young people <laughs> out the back smoking around, it's all quite a nice mixer and I, I, I'm, I'm just really excited about it. So I mean Ilan, <laughs> you, I, I got the definite vibe from from things you've said that one of the things you're seeing is a reluctance from the fantasy and 40k gamers to move across is that something that there's any room for you your, your side of the divide to fix or is it is it trying to understand their attitudes and working out how to make them uh, how to, how to get them interested um yeah I, I, I mean i think there's lots to be hopeful about um and part of it is just me being grumpy or me being um a curmudgeon so i think that there's lots that's uh that's going on that's really promising i think like saga is it hasn't always been my taste but i really love how um accessible and fun and board gamey it is and uh i think osprey is one of the best things to happen to um, what we would call light historical gaming. It's, it's my favorite company in terms of, but, but I also love Warlord. But um, uh, so I think there's lots to be excited about. I think that's great. For me, the question doesn't seem to be about whether it's dying out, because I don't think it is. But if I'm going to be grumpy, it's going to be about me watching the ways that it's changing so that I can do whatever I can, spend my money, organize my games to support the ways that I would like it to change more. So um, if if gaming is going towards larger companies that are much more interested in a bottom line, um, that's not a change that I like. Recently, I ordered some miniatures. I, in my, my current Debellus Antiquitatis project is um, medieval West Sudanese, which is um, not something that I thought I could even find. And I can't find it in 28, but I found it in 15 from Coruscant Miniatures, I think they're called. Yeah. I thought they were mostly sci-fi. I don't, th maybe I'm getting the name wrong. No, I, but I also, they do a lot of different. 
Oh, yeah, and then I was also yeah. able to find a whole army of Tuaregs to go against them. I don't even know what I'm pronouncing. Though. Those are like, the, those are people who live in the Sahara fighting against the people from just south of the Sahara in like the 13th century. I, and this just seems like a feller who runs that company and is producing these really cool stuff because whatever reason, right? And that's what I love about the hobby. I like, I, it doesn't have to be everybody doing it for free, but I do like independently owned shops and people doing things because they love it and you can sense it right off the bat. And I'm just going to say, that's why I love Bad Squiddo so much. The, I mean, yes. <laughs> the shipping, the shipping is a lot for me, you know, to, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but you can't do it. You can't brush up against Danny, your company without immediately knowing that you're really into it and that you're like <laughs> doing research and like involved. And, and so um, fantasy flight games, like with X-Wing, you just like, they produce good stuff. If they were to do something historical, that would be the new gold standard probably for a lot of people but you're never going to find medieval West Sudanese. You're not going to find whatever, Andy, what you sent me as a little bonus last time, uh, a guinea pig with a rocket on its back. Like, <laughs> that's cool. You did just, just, just to chip in before we get on, um, you, you kind of point out now that just how much there is out there, whereas it's not sticking just to those, you know, main sellers that people have always made. There's so many of us little bits popping up. Just, just, and just doing everything you can pretty much think of, which makes it an extra sort of golden age of excitement yeah. and goodness. And, and just in, the ter in terms of like, I just wanted, uh, not to take too much time, but Jay, what's the project you're doing with Lawns Connects right now? Uh, that, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we'll talk about it when we record here in a couple of weeks. Um, I am but Just doing... as a team of our podcast, you can tell us now. Um, I'm working on a Lons Connects versus Undead using Thomas Fox's lovely Triumph of Death uh, Renaissance Skeletons. And these, I mean, as somebody who loves Albert Durer and Renaissance, that kind of German Renaissance art, like as soon as I saw that, like that's, is it historical? Well, it's Renaissance art, 100%. And he's got a line of fighting rabbits taken yes. from the marginalia yes. of medieval manuscripts, that's historical wargaming more than anything else in my mind. Well like that, you know what I mean? And, and so, so, I, so in summary, and sorry to go on so long, I'm interested in things changing towards the support of people doing really exciting things like that. And that's where I want to try and vote with my dollar as much as I can and talk about and organize games and support people who are doing that because I think that's just a lovely direction to go. Henry, you've been champing at the bit. <laughs> um, well, the thing is, I mean, I, uh, I can echo what everyone else has said there, but for me, I, <laughs> au contraire to the rumour that historical wargaming is dying out, I'm absolutely thrilled that 50 years odd after I started wargaming, uh, there is more out there than I can even conceive of. Uh, that there are people, uh, as Ilan has just said, s able now to set up micro businesses. This is the, this is the big change, isn't it? You know, it, we used to describe uh, what we now call a micro business as a bloke in a shed, probably a grumpy bloke in a shed doing really bad castings, <laughs> right? Nowadays, there are people setting up. I mean, the most recent innovation, of course, is three D printing. You know, three D printing uh, machines and software and the materials to do it have uh, you know suddenly come way down in price. They're much more affordable. Jay and his brother. There's another plug for Jay. He's you know he and his brother Chris have started doing three D printing of stuff. You know, I'm sure that Annie gets a load of prototypes done and probably some of her products done using three D printing. This didn't <laughs> this didn't exist. You know, this was something that we heard about on a program called Tomorrow world not so long ago is oh maybe by the year 2050 you know people might be doing people are doing it right here right now producing stuff cut you, you can call someone and have them make something completely customized for you in the space of a few days absolutely astonishing i just you know i obviously i'm involved in the wargaming media you know i've got my patreon gig now i've been a magazine editor and when i think how a few years ago you know, even, you know, even when I was editor of Miniature War Games with Battle Games, which I quit in 2016, magazines still kind of dominated the scene. Here we are four years later and 
you're podcasting, Mike. I'm podcasting. Jay's podcasting. Annie's always on the air somewhere. Multiple, somewhere. <laughs> multiple things all over the place. There's any number of people running. And they're good quality podcasts. This is the other thing as well. That I, it's given our hobby a voice. YouTube channels, all these kind of things. If people want to find historical wargaming, they really don't have to go very far. We're out in what is now becoming the mainstream media. We used to bemoan the fact that once in a blue moon, oh, there might be an article in the local paper about someone who does some wargaming. <laughs> I can remember probably a decade ago i was thrilled because a local radio station wanted to interview me about the book you know and that was you know did you hear it well no i don't live in your part of the world so i didn't hear it you know it's uh, an extraordinary time that we're living through now our hobby i feel is burgeoning the fact that some of the statistics in a particular poll run by a particular magazine don't necessarily reflect that I don't think is actually a reflection of the true situation of our hobby. Yes, we've still got challenges. Of course we have. Yes, of course we'd like to bring in more people because we love the hobby. I've also met some commodities who said, I don't care if historical wargaming dies out because I'll be dead when that happens and I'll have, someone else will have the problem of selling off my collections on eBay, <laughs> right? There are some people like that, but I find, you know, I don't encounter them very often, thank goodness. I think certainly the people involved in this, you know, little gig are all hugely enthusiastic about the future of our hobby. And I think that we have every good reason to be enthusiastic. Oh, I feel like clapping. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be the perfect point I wish to wrap this, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for, uh, for your contributions. And um, I think we will wrap it right there.